everyone and welcome to the very first episode of Stage Talks, a podcast series celebrating everything theatre and dance at the Capstone. My name is Astrid Montero and today we will be talking to a very special guest and an alumna of the department, the one and only Jeraldine Lanier Duckworth. A native to Mississippi, Jeraldine got her bachelor's in theatre from the University of Southern Mississippi and her master's of fine arts in costume design and production from the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. She's back in Mississippi and founded an amazing organization called Bridging the Gap, a look into African-American hair and makeup for theatre. I could not be more excited to have her on this first episode of the series and learn more about her and her work since the capstone. So, without further ado, let's get started. Thank you so much for being here virtually with me. <laughs> I'm so excited about diving into today's conversation and I first want to start by learning a little bit about you and your background. My first question is what got you into theater and why costume head makeup? Um so I took an untraditional route, I guess you could say to get to theater. Um I was originally a fashion merchandising major or fashion design major. With my first two years, I went to community college, um, and then I went up to Southern Miss in Hattiesburg, and I realized that they only had fashion merchandising. That was a lot of numbers, and I'm not the fondest of math. For a literature class, I had to go and see Medea uh, that was playing in the theater. So I sat in the seats, and you know, I was so entranced by all of the elements coming together. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And the person that played Medea, she's a beautiful African-American woman, Lauren Turner. And she, um, I talked to her after the show and I said, hey, I said, I loved your performance. Like, you know, how do I get involved? Like who made your clothes? And she explained to me that there, you know, it was a whole costume shop. And I said, oh, I can translate fashion into theater. And so I did a practicum the next semester and I've been there ever since. And that was ooh, 13 years ago. 14 years ago this year. And I did the practicum, designed a few dance pieces, and I know I wanted more education. And my instructors told me that, you know, you could go off and get an MFA. And I went off to UA uh, in Tuscaloosa. And it was love, you know, I just love creating fashion for a specific time period. And so I fell in love with hair and makeup while I was a grad student um, at UA. Um, Martha Ruskai came in and did a workshop and I was like, oh, this is really cool. So I learned how to ventilate. Um, and then I ended up teaching the makeup class there for a couple semesters. And so that just kind of solidified the two worlds melding together. I have to say it all tied. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all tied. Yes. Tried and true. <laughs> is, was there a pivotal play in your career that made you think, okay, this is it. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Um, I think it was when I did at the end of grad school, um, crazy enough, um, when I got to design Chicago and I got to sit in the seats and see the show, all the stress, all the headache that came along with it. But it's, Something about that first performance where the curtains open, I know it sounds so crazy, um, but I love sitting in like the center and hearing the orchestra and hearing all of the music and the lights. And, and I said, this is what I want to do. Like, I, I love this. And I've been working freelancing ever since. I think that that was my pivotal moment because I came to grad school, wanted to learn more. I wasn't, still sold on like this as a career, if that makes sense. Um, until that last show, and it was just like a arc of all of the hard work and classes that I had taken and learning and learning how to sew, like so many elements thrown at me at once. And I sat and I said, I could do this for the rest of my life. And I, that's what I've been doing. It's evolved, but we're still doing the same thing. <laughs> my last question, about your background is, do you have a favorite show that you've designed? Hmm. I feel like that is a very difficult question to ask anybody. It is. Um, Chicago's one of my favorites because it's one of my favorite shows. Um, I also had the opportunity to do a small production of A Raisin in the Sun. Um, and I love Lorraine Hansberry. So that was a emotional experience for me because I've studied her, read her work, and you know, I've actually got to like stage one of her productions. And so it, 
it's a tie between those two, I think. Um, I would love to do Chicago again. I love the glitz in the 1920s. So it, it appeals to all of my design aesthetic. So backtracking to your decision to get your master's degree, why did you pick UA? I interviewed at a couple different schools, you know, got the portfolio together that, you know, of the work that I had. And it just felt like a really good fit um, when I interviewed Donna interviewed me. I sat down in her office and she told me about the program. I met the outgoing graduate students and it just felt like it would be a good, good home for me. And full disclosure, my grandmother's like 45 minutes up the road in Columbus. And so I was like, oh, I could still get a home cooked meal too. So <laughs> that played a lot into my decision to come to Tuscaloosa. And I lived in Biloxi, still do at the time. Um, and so I was like, okay, it's four hours away from my parents because we're super close to, we're a tight knit family. Um, and, I, and I said, okay, this is good. I like this. It's far enough away but it's not too far that I could come home to. So, but I love the campus. I love the atmosphere and coming from Southern Miss, which had a big ish campus walking on the quad. I was like, Oh, this is huge. Okay. This is great. And I love all the people that I met at UA that kind of helped push me in the right direction. When I got the email saying I had been accepted, I was sitting in my theater history class, getting ready to take my final. And I was like, I got in. And so my professor was quite happy because he had helped me prepare my portfolio and prepare for the interview. So it was a a good moment. That sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. So next I want to talk about Bridging the Gap. Okay. What's been your journey from graduate school to Bridging the Gap and what planted the seeds for the organization? So Bridging the Gap was not planned whatsoever. Coming into graduate school, I was the only person of color my year in 09. Um, And so a lot of questions were defaulted to me um, by my grad school friends who we still keep in touch to this day. We're on a rather large group text, all of us, because there were seven of us all together. And so, you know, they would ask me questions in there was a lot that I took for granted being a person of color. I was like, oh, everybody should know this. Like, you know, these are things that I thought were talked about, but apparently they were not. I came back to UA in 2018 to give a workshop in conjunction with Seven Guitars. And so post that workshop, there were still so many questions about hair and about makeup. And of course, I still had my grad school friends texting me and asking me questions. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to start you know, a Facebook page. So that was November of 2018. So 2019, January 2nd, Bridging the Gap goes online. And it, by February 1st, it was shared so many times. And I said, oh, okay, there's a need for this. And figuring out how to structure it was another thing because You know, I wanted it to be hair and makeup, but research is at the forefront of what I do because so many young designers say, oh, how do you find these pictures? Or, you know, where where can I look for this? And so I post photo four days a week. March of that same year, I was asked to do my first speaking engagement. And I had students of color that stood before me and cried. They've been at conservatories and these institutions paying X amount of dollars a year, and they've only ever played a servant, or they've only ever had their hair put in a turban because nobody knows what to do with their hair. They put a hat on it, you know? And that was my watershed moment. Well, one of many um, that I was like, oh, this is, this, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I like this. And public speaking always has scared me. I was like, who would want to hear me talk? And when I went to eight or nine universities that year, the only reason why I came down out of the air um, was because I was getting married um, that January of the following year in 2020. My mom was like, you, you got to come down out of the air, kid. Like, <laughs> you, you got a wedding to finish planning. And so that's kind of been my journey with Bridging the Gap. Of course, with COVID now, a lot of my workshops are online. I was so worried because I had gained such good momentum going to universities. And I said, what's going to happen? You know, and last year I gave 67 Zoom workshops for Bridging the Gap. 33 of those were from universities. Um, So I've probably seen over 
a thousand people come through my virtual doors of Bridging the Gap. I couldn't have traveled to that many places online. So COVID was a blessing in disguise because I've been able to reach more people online because everything's electronic for at least the foreseeable future. I think I'm going to be online probably all this year and see what 2022 looks like. Yeah, the online has definitely been a blessing in disguise because it's open. A lot of our programming is sometimes reaches international borders and we're like, whoa, cool. Yeah. Um, when I look at the Facebook analytics for the page and I was like, oh, okay. It's in the UK. It's in Japan. It's, it's everywhere. And when I get emails, I'm like, oh, wow. And I had to use Google Translate a lot because I'm like, oh, and um, I had people from the UK, Germany, Okinawa in Japan, San Paulo, like take my workshops. And so I'm like, oh, this is insane. And of course I love anything from the UK because I was like, oh, you sound like you should be drinking tea. <laughs> and, so, and then one of the ladies was like, look, I have my tea cup, Jerry. And I was like, this is great. This is all of my dreams. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> so how did that become then a nonprofit organization? So the nonprofit I'm still currently working at the Kings for. I'm working on the nonprofit, the Bridging the Gap Foundation, um, because I want to give away scholarships to BIPOC students. I had the luxury of having two parents that could help me financially. If my iPad broke, they could replace it. I was very blessed in that. And in speaking to students, they don't always have, you know, someone that can support them. Some are first generation college students. And so their parents don't quite understand this world of theater and what it costs to make it and what it costs to just be able to take classes because art supplies alone are super expensive. I know Hobby Lobby and Kinko's in Tuscaloosa took a lot of my money when I was in school because I needed paper, watercolor. I had to print plates and different things like that. And so the first year, the scholarship will focus on costumes because, of course, that's my area. Um, I'm going to start there. And then I want to have a rotating scholarship that goes through dance and film. I want to touch on all the, the big areas and have high school seniors and freshmen be able to apply and then have a, a art supplier that they can write to me and say, hey, you know, I need this or that, and I'll be able to send those supplies out to them. So... It's just a way of adding to philanthropy work that I'm already doing. And once COVID is done, because my copious amounts of free time, I do photography too. And I want to be able to go in to different schools and be able to offer headshots. Because if you're a performer or now design tech wants a lot of headshots too. And I've always tried to hide from that. Uh, when I have to send in like bios and stuff, it's like, oh, send a headshot. And I was like, oh, I should probably get nice headshots. But that's something that I want to be able to offer, you know, anyone who needs one because a good photo, you're going to use it over and over and over again. So I want to add that into it as well. So it'll grow over time, but this will be kind of like the inaugural year of scholarship and working at the kinks and different things like that. But I just want to be able to help make the college experience an enjoyable one for BIPOC students. Speaking of artists and headshots, one of the issues that comes with being an artist is that being an artist in itself is pretty expensive with headshots and auditions and travel and all of those other things that really start to add up really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and for artists from minority groups, I feel like that cost increases um, because in many ways they often have to go that extra step from maybe pancaking ballet shoes or buying foundation of their own. And so how do you think that your organization could help artists? So through the workshops that I give, I talk to, you know, practicing uh, makeup artists, wig artists, people that are in, that hold the purse strings at these universities, shop managers about like, what do you have in your makeup closet? Do you have certain things that foundations, you know, don't just buy foundations for your complexion, buy foundations, do a wide range. Um, so I talked to them about how to purchase 
various foundations so students and performers can have those options. If you forget a foundation, I have been teaching it. Um, the mass is how to match foundations for deeper complexions or if someone has an olive skin tone. So I think with the workshops, I try to put that information out into the world. That's why I post on my Facebook page any different brands that I found that could work. Um, the standard makeup kit works for most, but it doesn't work for all. Um, so you may have to recommend brands. And so I'm really big on this line has a really good range for deeper complexions. A lot of Native American brands are popping up. And so that's a really good option to have too, because they're adhering to the Native American you know, skin tones and undertones and different things like that. So being able to have those recommendations readily available to give, I think is a really good option too. So trying to combat a lot. I talked to many performers, many working artists. And so that's kind of how I tailor a lot of, of the work that I do because I want to be as focused as possible on the issues at hand and bringing those to the forefront. I answer a lot of emails. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken a lot of emails to emails that have issues. And so it's like, oh, maybe I could cover this topic. So to know that, you know, oh, okay, well, language is important. Things, you know, you shouldn't say, things you can say in lieu of those things. So we'll come back to language in a little bit. Okay. But how do you think designers can be allies to actors and how actors can be allies to designers? Because really it takes a village to create a theater production. It does. Um, research, that's where I find a lot of the problems because performers of color will get images that don't look anything like them. And I always say, you don't have to find their twin in history or for the world that you're creating, but find research that can help them get into character. And bringing performers of color in on the conversation, but not making them do the work. Don't make them find their own images and different things like that. You know, talk to them about the world you're trying to create and get their input. That's important too. And so I think doing a thorough job and finding those good photographs and asking your performer, you know, hey, what are you comfortable with? What can we do to help this transition process with hair, with makeup, with costumes? I mean, being aware of any type of stereotypes from the period that you may play into designing. Cultural appropriation comes into that. That's a big thing. And, you know, just being hyper aware of reading the room, um, I guess is a short way to put it. Read the room and see who's in your room and be sensitive to the, the performers that are there. Are there any resources or any websites that you have found doing your work for so many years? Are there any gold mines of resources that you have found that you really like using? For research photographs, I love public libraries. I will go through and look and just go through the stacks of images that they have. The Library of Congress is the gift that keeps on giving. You can find so many wonderful research images from anywhere in time, just about. Or you can read firsthand accounts from people that lived during those times. The African American Museum in DC, um, that's a gold mine and they update their research images a lot. And so you get to see, you know, even if it's not specifically what you're looking for, you may find a painter or you might find a photographer or a choreographer from the time that you're looking for. And that can send you, as I say, down another rabbit hole, but I'm all about them. I love pouring through these old photographs. Um, so those are my main places. And a lot of state libraries have really good images too. So say you're a designer for someone in Pittsburgh or you know a prominent photographer may have, have shot there. Um, and so being well-versed in the region that you're just designing for, um, you can look at state libraries. And then would you say there are issues with availability of makeup for uh, artists of color? The makeup industry is getting better. There's a lot of improvement that can be done. I think knowing what brands and what they offer is important um, because there are some brands now that are African-American owned. You know, they might put out a killer red lipstick and that's something that, you know, you would need for your kit. Or they might have great blushes because that's a big misconception that 
women of color can't wear blush. And I was like, um, I, li- I love a good blush. <laughs> I'm all about it. And so knowing like Juvia's Place has a really awesome blush palette. I have them a lot in my work bag, a lot of their products. And so I think knowing where to send students and performers is big. The makeup is there. You have to dig for it if that makes sense. So, so many times students are dismissed or performers are dismissed because the person that they're asking may not know and they haven't done any research. And so that that's a, a big part of the problem too, but it's there. But what's the standard may not work. And that's what I'm trying to put out there. I was like, okay, you might have used a Ben Nile or a Krylon or a Mayron kit for the past 20 years. But this crop of students that's coming up, if they can find it on YouTube, Google, anything like that, like they're all about it. Or if they have a favorite YouTuber, they might want to use the products that he or she is using. And so being able to relate to the generations coming up now is, is important. And what's your experience been like working with hair? Hair. Hair has been fine for me. When I was taught hair and makeup, Martha always told me if I couldn't do both, and by both I mean hair that doesn't look like mine, I won't be able to work. And so I took that to heart and I learned everything I could about hair that I wasn't familiar with. And so I try to impart that on younger designers to say, hey, I know we're all comfortable with working with what looks like us. And that's fine, but theater is a lovely, beautiful melting pot of all different ethnicities, hair types, skin complexions. And so you have to want to learn for the masses. Um, And so that's something that I try to impart. But hair's always fun. I love creating texture with hair and doing wigs and different things like that. So I'm always experimenting with different methods that may work, different wigs and Creating texture for wigs is something that I pride myself on doing for performers of color because, you know, they're in a time period, but I also feel like they should look like themselves a little bit within that time period. So I don't want someone to go from like this lovely, gorgeous fro to silky straight hair. And it's like, ah, that might be kind of a stretch. Let's see if we can add some texture in there. So always playing. I love ventilating too when I have the time, making facial pieces and different things like that. So that's a lot that comes under hair and I'm always trying new products and seeing what's available out there. Hair products is something that's very hard to recommend just because it's Everyone's texture is different. So I just primarily put brands up a lot of the time that I've tried or that I've gotten good reviews from, from other performers. And so just doing a lot of research and seeing what's there. As an arts management student, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you this, but what do you think management in performing arts centers can do to help? And it's crazy because I'm teaching a theater management course, which is so out of the wheelhouse now, (laughs) production procedures, which deals with theater management. What does theater management do? And we just recently talked about this and budgets. And so... Oh, I love budgets. (laughs) And so if you have a designer or artist that comes to you and says, we have a predominantly African-American cast and they give you a breakdown as to, you know, why they need additional funds because that does happen. Um, And so being aware of you may need extra money for makeup if there's not any in stock. So I just say, you know, hearing if a designer comes to you and says this and they are asking for additional money and just being willing to maybe work with them to see where you can find money from. But on the flip side to that, I always tell designers, have a breakdown of what things cost. So it's like, oh, I need an additional four or $500, but why do you need that money? So I'm very big on, you know, actor A may need this, actor B may need this, actor C, I may have to send him or her out for X amount of salon trips and all that stuff. So I said, give a detailed breakdown if you're going to ask for extra money. So all powers that be can see like, oh, they're not just asking for, you know, random money just because. And then coming back to language that you mentioned earlier, I think one of the biggest issues, not only in the performing arts world, but across the board is that a lot of people are probably afraid Mm -hmm. to speak and are afraid of offending people around them. 
but really it's about learning to feel comfortable being uncomfortable mm-hmm. and so what do you think you'd say to people who are afraid to have some of those conversations that really need to be had ask take the leap of faith and ask because you will never know if you do not ask and with bridge in the gap i tried to create a safe space to ask questions and when i talked to directors or you know producers and they said well jeren you know i think i've angered my cast and i was like well what did you say let's talk about that process and so i was like this is why they're upset i can be willing to bet you my last dollar like the language that you used offended so being aware if you direct a show that has sensitive subjects and being aware i had a performer say Jerlyn, our director lined us up from lightest to darkest. And so it's like, "Oh, you, you can't do that." And then, and she's like, "Jerlyn, I just felt like I was on the deeper end of the spectrum, and so we were made to feel like we had did something wrong." And so I talk a lot about colorism and what that means in the African American community and being aware of just those microaggressions that you may have the best intentions, but it may be perceived, you know, somewhere completely different. What are some of the other issues that you come across frequently or not so frequently doing this work? The hate mail that I get. Oh no. From my assumption is older theater practitioners that, you know, why are you trying to change theater? Theater was just fine before you came along. I get called out of my name. Why do I think that I should be the voice of, you know, students and performers and research Fridays if it's something that they don't they don't like? You know, it's like, "Oh, well, you're always posting about Native Americans, Asians." And I was just like, "Oh, but I put the information out there for the masses to see. It's not a me trying to persuade you that one thing is better than the other. It's just merely putting these images out there, especially info about playwrights or different makeup brands to help make that transition easier for BIPOC students and performers, but many are resistant to change. So I finally figured out how to filter those nasty emails out where I don't have to see them. But it's I get a lot of those. It used to bother me when I first started. I was like, "No, that's not my intention and I think you're just being mean." And my husband explained to me. He said, "Jerilyn, that's how you know you're doing something right. When you have people that are angry because you're trying to make life better for BIPOC students and performers." And so when he told me that, I was like, "Oh, okay, that makes sense." And so it it's just water off a duck's back now with that. And so I used to try to want to explain and I said, "No, I'm not going to do that. Like I don't owe you an explanation and my education. I I have to defend my education a lot. You know, that's challenge." And I said, "Well, do you do this to everybody or is it just me?" And I was like, "Well, what kind of education do you have to be posting these images or making these suggestions?" And I was like, "I have an MFA too. No, I'm heavily considering getting a doctorate degree in research because I want in um African American like history and research um because I do eventually want to publish and start working on a costume history book and all of that good stuff. And so, hate mail in my education is attacked a lot. And then just the work that I do in general, some people may not like it and that's fine. I'm not for everyone and that's okay. Yeah. Do you also come across a lot of resistance to change in performing arts centers when maybe you're doing some design work or something? And how do you deal with that? I voice my opinion a lot and I'm usually in on show selection stuff as of late and you know I tried to make it so it's a diverse season. don't just pick the same shows in a circle all the time. And so those discussions get very spirited. I will say that. Biggest thing I always hear is like, "Oh, we can't do like African American shows or Latin X shows because we don't have the performers to put in these roles." And I was like, "Well, audition. Go into places and look for the talent." But it's so many times they want to use who they already know. and who they're familiar and comfortable with and I was like well you're never going to to grow that way. And so I've left a few places because of show selection and that in casting that I didn't feel like was fair. 
I mean, I was like, y'all are never going to change because you don't want to come into the now and be willing to cast, I guess you could say the non-traditional performers for these roles. And I was like, they're there. You just have to be willing to go searching and look for them. And then do you see any of these same issues or any different issues when it comes to theater and higher education? Casting is big in higher education. It needs to change. I know some predominantly white institutions are working on this because there was a letter that was published pretty much holding up a mirror and saying, hey, you know, we're not gonna stand for this anymore. These are what we see that needs to change. And so a lot of institutions are taking what's out there and what's being said in light of everything that's happened in the past couple years and trying to actively make a change. But it's costuming, it's, you know, bringing in designers that, you know, students can relate to or bringing in choreographers that students can relate to as well. Change is happening, but it's very sad. And I think it starts from the top and works its way down. And so the people sitting above chairs and chancellors and different things like that have to be willing to see that there's an issue and want to to work on it. Awesome. And then ending on a positive note, what is your favorite thing about the work that you do? I love that I get to meet so many people. I love that you know, I can see the change. I, I do get the positive email. So I say the negative to say, I love when students or instructors write to me and they say, Geraldine, you know, I had a student that hugged me and cried and said, you want to help me find foundation or you want to help me dye my ballet shoes, you know, and, and work with me on that. And, or perform that say, you know, for the first time, you know, my hair isn't under a hat or in a turban because My professor took your hair workshop over the summer, so they want to work with me and show images that put me in my character. And so I I love those moments of, okay, this might be working, because I'm always, I need to stop second guessing myself, but it's those happy moments that I love hearing from. Or, you know, a young designer will say, I had trouble finding this, but then I Googled this and I found this, and so just, being willing to put the work in, I think, is is really good, too. That's so much fun. And I'm so excited to see what the Bridge in the Gap Foundation can do and who it can help. And eventually, I would love to be able to send someone to an audition or buy that first iPad for digital rendering and really help to aid students coming up through these programs and just kind of be that extra support. So... It's a lot of paperwork, but I know it'll definitely be worth it in the end. Plus, you can hire someone to do the paperwork. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) So I just have to learn to relinquish that and turn it, because it's been my baby for two years. And so I know I'm going to have to hire help, multiple people, I'm sure, to help me with all of the logistics. And so mm-hmm. just turning over and it not being just me will be a, a step because I'm very like, got to oversee everything, but I got to learn to to let the reins loosen just a little bit. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to add to our conversation as a whole? Yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, this is my, my second podcast. So this, like I was telling you earlier, this is a new world to me. I love that you're at UA where I went. So yes. I was happy to do this and be here. And I just say, you know, everyone's a vehicle for change. I say it at the end of every workshop that I give. Everyone's a vehicle for change. Be willing to help your neighbor, love your neighbor. And I think the world will definitely be a better place. I and mean, that's what I try to produce project with Bridging the Gap um, is to be an ally, to help, um, and to be willing to be a part of the good change that's happening. Well, thank you so much, Ellen, for joining us today and sharing your insights and good luck with your future projects. Yes, thank you. Thank you. A huge thank you again to Jedlin for joining us on this episode of Stage Talks. You can find more of her work at bridgingthegapintheater.com. Thank you for tuning in. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for more updates at UA Theatre Dance. More episodes of Stage Talks can be found on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash UA Theatre Dance. 
See you next time.